The development of infrastructure and infrastructure services is a key policy and public sector investment area for many countries. The need to understand the differences between men and women are in terms of who uses the infrastructure, who will benefit and in what ways from public policy and investment in this area are vital to the mainstreaming of gender into public policy. However, this area is under-examined in terms of gender desegregated statistics. There are also significant substantive and methodological challenges that this module will seek to explore. Firstly, what do we mean by infrastructure? This module will be focusing on four areas of infrastructure. Transport and travel, information and communication technology, energy, water. It will focus not on the infrastructure networks within these areas, but in particular on the services that these infrastructure networks deliver, what is referred to as infrastructure services. That is, it will not focus on the physical networks, but the resulting travel that they facilitate, the use of information and communication technologies that rely on them, the energy services they deliver, and the access to safe water and sanitation they provide. Women and men play different roles in society, undertake different tasks, and, as a result, use infrastructure services such as public transport, ICT, and energy services in different ways, at different times, and in different places. There are also differences between men and women in terms of their access to the physical assets and resources needed to be able to use infrastructure services. Assets are defined as stocks of financial, human, natural, or social resources that can be acquired, developed, transformed, improved, and transferred across generations. Access embraces not only the ownership and the legal rights, but also the control that an individual may have or claim over a present or a future asset, in terms of the disposal of the asset and its use. As a result, there may be differences within households between men and women in terms of who regularly uses and has access to assets such as cars, motorbikes, and bicycles. There may also be differences in the level of ownership and control of such assets as mobile phones and computers needed to use communication networks or who can negotiate use of scarce money to be able to make public transport journeys. There may also be differences between male and female-headed households in terms of ownership of assets and lack of infrastructure services. Who carries the burden of fetching water and fuel wood when water and energy infrastructure services are universally available? As a result, this module will focus on two elements of infrastructure services which may reveal gender differences. First, use of services and Second, access to resources and assets to be able to access infrastructure services, for example, car ownership and mobile phone ownership. How do gender differences impact particular infrastructure sectors? Let us firstly take transport. A long tradition in transport research has demonstrated that women have different transport and travel patterns to men across the world. Women's multiple roles and their associated time poverty impacts significantly on the ways they travel. It influences how much time they spend traveling. It influences who they travel with and for what purpose. Perhaps most significantly, it influences the scheduling of the journeys that are made. Women's greater time burden often means that their trips need to be made between doing other household tasks. As a result, any changes in travel time impact their other time tasks. Reliability and the ability to minimize the knock-on effects of travel disruption upon other tasks are, therefore, much more important for women's travel than for men's. Access to financial resources does allow some women to overcome such time burdens. Many middle and high income women are increasingly reducing the time required for traveling by securing independent access to a car. 
A key difference in the developed world is the propensity of women to combine a set of activities relating to their extensive range of household tasks within the overall structure of one journey period, whereas men are more likely to make a single purpose trip. These differences in transport and travel patterns are generated out of the differential accesses of the genders to economic resources, social resources, and time resources. The evidence is clear from a wealth of sociological studies that in most cultures, women are time poor because of the disproportionate level of household tasks they are required to perform within present social structures as compared with men. The increasing number of single-parent households increases the time poverty of women, and female-headed households are typically poorer with less financial resources available to buy assistance to reduce the burden of time poverty. Men have, on average, more available financial resources than women. This has important implications for the relative affordability of both private and public transport. At the same time, it is very important to note that, in the context of widening social and economic inequalities in recent decades, there is also increasing polarization between the incomes of the least and the worst off women in our society. Again, these trends have important implications for patterns of transport use. How safe we are when we travel is also an area where gender differences have an impact. Data from across 15 member states of the European Union demonstrates that more men than women are likely to be killed in road accidents. Road safety is, perhaps, one of the few areas in the transport sector where sex desegregated data could be easily produced. There is easily available EU-wide comparable data that is sex desegregated and that is available through the European Commission. The Directorate General for Transport and Energy administers the database for accident data across member states. Furthermore, they provide sex desegregated analysis of the data. Unfortunately, this data is frequently not yet available for new member states. The use of communication and information technology is now a significant part of the fabric of everyday European life for an ever-increasing number of people. As a result, it is an increasingly important area for sex desegregated data production and use. Despite its increasing importance in everyday life, there are differences in how such technology impacts the lives of men and women. Men and women use different information and communication technologies for different purposes, which may be related to differences in time availability by men and women within households. Men frequently use new technologies for leisure-related activities. Differences also exist in terms of access to communication networks through internet-enabled computers, mobile phones, and other IT technologies. Whilst ownership is one issue, the ability to secure the use of such assets and to claim scarce household income to pay for communication services may also differ for men and women. Energy is a key infrastructure area where very little work has been undertaken on its gender impact. The availability of energy infrastructure services frees girls and young women's time from survival activities such as gathering firewood, fetching water, cooking inefficiently, crop processing by hand, and manual farming work. Clean cooking fuels and equipment reduces exposure to indoor air pollution and health hazards related to traditional cooking. Good quality lighting makes possible home study and evening classes for girls and boys. Street lighting improves women's safety. Affordable and reliable energy services offer scope for women's business activity. The example of many countries where access to energy, particularly electricity and energy for heating and cooking is not universally available, shows that there is a differential impact on men and women within a household. For instance, 
the burden of time and the physical energy in seeking and preparing fuel wood to meet energy needs falls disproportionately on women and girls. In addition, pollution from burning coal, wood, and traditional biomass fuels is a significant source of particulate pollution in rural homes and informal urban settlements and slum areas. Smoke from traditional cooking and heating methods contains toxic substances that contribute to respiratory disease, cancer, and eye problems. The World Health Organization, in its 2009 Global Health Risks Report, estimated that in 2004, two million people across the developing world, mainly women and children, died from illnesses linked to indoor air pollution caused by the burning of solid fuel. There may also be issues around who has rights to woodland for fuel wood and whether female-headed households and older women have the same rights and physical ability to harvest and manage woodland for energy as men and women within male-headed households. This may equally be relevant in some rural areas of Eastern Europe and Central Asia, where biomass, such as firewood and animal dung, provides a small but significant source of energy for cooking. Even in contexts where energy infrastructure and access is widespread, there are questions around affordability of energy infrastructure services such as electricity and gas. Female-headed households may have disproportionately lower levels of income to be able to afford gas and electricity supplies. They may also suffer disproportionately from increases in energy prices. There may also be differences in the access and availability that female-headed households have to assets that utilize energy services such as central heating, refrigerators, and air conditioning, as well as energy efficiency measures such as home insulation, efficient heating boilers, and refrigeration equipment. Servicing a household's energy needs, when universal access to energy services is not available, can place a disproportionate burden in terms of time and physical energy on women and girls in the household. Data from a number of demographic and health surveys carried out in recent years across Eastern Europe and Central Asia highlight that even though access to electricity is nearly universal in rural areas, energy for cooking comes from a diverse range of sources. Biomass, such as firewood and dung, provide a significant source for some rural communities within the county surveyed and its use can come with disproportionate burdens on women and children in terms of the time to collect it and in terms of the health risks from its use. As for water infrastructure services, the knowledge from many parts of the world where universal access to safe water is at a low level, particularly in rural areas, tells us that there is a differential impact upon men and women within households from the lack of accessible safe drinking water. The burden of collecting water and disposing of wastewater falls disproportionately on women and children. This is both in terms of time required to carry it from the source, the physical challenge, and the resulting health impact of carrying enough water for daily household consumption. There is often an additional carrying burden placed on women in taking care of any sick children as a result of the higher level of childhood illness suffered by those not able to access safe drinking water. There may also be issues of affordability, particularly for female-headed households, in contexts where water infrastructure services are available but where user fees are deregulated. Gender differences resulting from lack of water infrastructure services may not be uniform across a country or region. Differences in gender impact may occur between households in urban and rural areas, depending on the success of infrastructure networks provisions in rural areas. Even in areas of Central Asia where there is a high level of access to safe water, water may not be available throughout the day, but only for a few hours a day. As a result, there may be a difference in how this restriction of infrastructure services impacts on men and women within the household. Coordinating the time for collecting water, especially if journeys are of considerable distance, within the routine of daily activities can be a burden that falls mostly on women and children. Methodologies for data collection on infrastructure services have mainly focused on diary-based surveys on household use of infrastructure services 
with some sex disaggregation of data or gender-sensitive analysis. There is also little common agreement between countries on the definitions and features of such surveys, often making cross-country comparison very difficult. Furthermore, household surveys that measure access to assets such as car ownership or access to water infrastructure frequently gather information at the household level, often without differentiating who in the household gets access to or control over that asset. However, there are increasing opportunities in time use surveys and living standards measurement surveys to collect more detailed sex disaggregated information. For example, in the transport sector, analyzing daily mobility by gender is not easy. Daily mobility statistics for the European Union, for example, are not part of the European statistical system. Information on daily mobility is very heterogeneous. Data collected across member states is not easily comparable. The information collected and the definitions used are not common across countries. For example, short walking journeys are included or not included depending on which country is analyzed. Journey distances can also vary among countries, from distances reported by the respondent to those where they are synthetically calculated. The year of data collection also varies by country, as do the indicators of daily mobility. All these factors make comparative analysis very difficult. Furthermore, there are many member states, including some new European Union member states, where no national travel survey is available. In addition to these challenges, a recent study for the European Parliament revealed that it was difficult to obtain a sex-desegregated picture of daily mobility of national travel. The main reason is that most countries with national travel surveys collected and analyzed travel at the household level, making no distinction between household members. A new approach is, thus, necessary to be able to develop a sex-desegregated picture of mobility. It was found that time-use data can provide a viable option to gather gender and transport data. There are still challenges with this approach as it may not provide other useful travel data, such as purpose of journeys made or travel means. In order to allow sex-desegregated data to be collected, Travel should be seen in terms of other household activities and be comparable across countries, which will bring significant benefits. Time use statistics offer a unique tool for exploring a wide range of policy concerns, including social change, division of labor, allocation of time for household work, the estimation of the value of household production, transportation, leisure and recreation, pension plans, and health care programs, among others. As described in the UNECE Gender Statistics Manual, time use surveys are a type of population-based sample surveys that collect information from individuals on what they do with their time and how they allocate it to different activities over a specific period, typically 24 hours of one or more days. They provide a picture of people's daily lives and are a rich source of gender-relevant information. There has been a concerted effort by the European Commission and member states across Europe over the last decade to develop time-use surveys as a tool with very good levels of cross-country comparability for European policy development across a wide range of areas. This effort is captured in the European Harmonized Time-Use Survey. A number of countries have chosen to take part in this coordinated series of sample surveys of individuals within households. The surveys cover time spent undertaking all activities, not just travel. Initially, 10 member states took part, four of which are new EU member states. Since the year 2000, five more countries, of which three are new EU member states, have since completed the national time use surveys following the European Commission's guidelines on harmonized European time use surveys. The national time use surveys provide a consistent and comparable way of asking questions about travel. It also provides a sex differentiated analysis of data, thus providing one of the best datasets in Europe for understanding gendered patterns of mobility. 
It is also the main data set that will be quoted throughout this section. Time use data cannot, however, be used unquestionably as the time and the overall economic climate of the state at the time when the survey was conducted will be reflected on the time use data obtained. This is particularly the case for some new European Union member states that are characterized by dynamic social and economic change. Sex desegregated time use data is of significant value in understanding how men and women travel. This graph highlights that women travel by slower modes than men, according to time use data from a range of countries across the EU. Women spend more time traveling by bus and on foot. Men, by contrast, spend more time traveling by car, bicycle, and by train. Because the surveys measure time use, it is impossible to say anything about the number of journeys made. However, a consistent pattern can be tracked which shows that women use travel modes that take a longer time to complete any individual journey. The variations between member states are again characterized by differences in car ownership levels, with new member states with car ownership levels reporting less inequality in mode use than some older member states. This may be a source of greater gender inequality in mobility, as car ownership levels rise in the new member states in the coming years. Methodologies within ICT have traditionally focused mainly on access to resources as measurement of assets. There are, for example, internationally comparable data available from the International Telecommunications Union on fixed-line phone ownership, computer equipment availability, and mobile phone ownership. However, this data is collected at a household level and seldom analyzed from a gender perspective. As a result, issues of differences between men and women within households in the use and control of such household assets as telephones, computers, and mobile phones present significant challenges for gender statistics in this area of infrastructure. In addition, there is traditionally very little data on telecommunications use, rather than asset ownership. Time use data can highlight the differences in how men and women use information and communication technologies in their everyday lives. Data from the European Harmonized Time Use Surveys conducted in a range of European Union member states show that men spend more time than women using ICT. The 2006 European Community Survey on ICT usage in households and by individuals reports that young women and men use the Internet for different purposes. Men view technology use more frequently as a hobby or leisure time. Women, however, spend more of their time undertaking computing as a more utilitarian or instrumental activity to aid activity scheduling, maintain social contacts, or replace activities for which travel would be otherwise necessary. The measurement of gender differences in access to infrastructure assets can be improved using Living Standard Measurement Surveys. The Living Standard Measurement Study Surveys, developed by the World Bank, are an attempt to provide a consistent data tool for assessing human development to provide some of the most comparable formats for gathering information on access to a range of resources and assets. They were developed as part of an effort to explore ways of improving the type and quality of household data collected by statistical offices in developing countries. LSMS seeks to foster increased use of household data as a basis for policy decision-making. Specifically, the LSMS is working to develop new methods to monitor progress in raising levels of living, to identify the consequences for households of past and proposed government policies, and to enable improved communications between statisticians, analysts, and policymakers. There are frequent cases when LSMS methodology captures a range of asset availability, such as household and community access to safe drinking water, wastewater infrastructure, access to vehicles, and mobile phone and computer ownership. For example, in the water sector, the Joint Monitoring Program of the WHO and UNICEF have sought to maximize the potential for household surveys associated with living standards measurement to capture data on access to water infrastructure services and assets.
they have developed guidelines for harmonizing the questions that household surveys could ask on access to drinking water and sanitation services. This is an example of a question on a household's main source of drinking water suggested in the guidelines. In conclusion, gender and infrastructure services is an important but frequently neglected area in gender statistics. There are significant challenges to develop gender statistics in this area, but the increased use of time-use surveys and the potential of living standards measurement study surveys present some real opportunities to enable mainstreaming gender in this important policy area for the development of many countries.